In August of 2023, Amanda Suknik and Mati Hairi published a new argument for antinatalism. They also claim that the existing arguments for antinatalism, arguments like axiological asymmetry, quality of life, risk to life and consent arguments, these are all philosophically sound arguments, but they don't provide enough impetus for antinatalist activism. And therefore, their intention is to strengthen the tools that we already have for antinatalist activism by adding this new argument. So let's have a look at what that argument is. Through the process of reproduction, we were brought into this sentient existence by our parents. This imposed the burdens of life and death and all the hardships involved in between upon us. The point to note here is that it is not just that the life is imposed upon us, but death is also an inescapable imposition. In words of David Benatar, life is bad, but so is death. Linda and Mati emphasize on the fact that it is the existing people that they are talking about. It is the existing people upon whom the imposition of life and death is placed. They are not talking about some potential prospective being. There are many kinds of impositions as a result of being born. The instincts as a result of millions of years of evolution have created desires for nutrition, desire for having sex, desire to continue living, fear of death and so on. Depending on the society or culture that you are born into, there are legal and cultural impositions. There are social norms that you have to abide by including the expectation that you also should be having children in turn. It is this second type of imposition called as postnatal mental imposition that the authors want to bring our attention to. The imposition has three properties. It has to be on existing people. It has to be unobjectionable. And it has to be avoidable with varying degrees of efforts, like only just. Focusing on existing people avoids complex subjects around potential beings, prospective beings and so on. The unobjectionable part needs a little bit of explaining because there are many people who feel that it's not an imposition. They feel happy that somebody brought them into existence. They understand that there are risks to life also, but they say that there are solutions to mitigate those risks. Among those solutions are things like parental love and education. Amanda and Mati say that these solutions themselves are actually part of the problem. If you have a headache and I give you a pill, then I am helping you. But if I create an ache in your head and then give you a pill as a cure to that, then I am still imposing headache upon you. Even if I convince you that this is the pill and I am helping you, what is happening in fact is I am imposing suffering upon you. Similarly, the manipulation done to us during our upbringing and the education given to us helps to appreciate life more. It teaches us to appreciate the life more and that helps us to cope with the burdens of life and the sufferings of the lives. But it also furthers the problem. What it does is it blinds us from seeing the imposition as burden to start with. And therefore, this education and the upbringing, which is a solution, becomes part of the problem itself. Now. Whether this sort of imposition is avoidable or not can be debated. In a strict religious or conservative society, generally the punishments or penalties for not abiding by social norms are well defined. The authors take examples of Judeo-Christian tradition where children could be stoned to death for not abiding by certain social norms, for example, for not on honoring their parents. But in a modern liberal society, this sort of thing does not exist. We don't have these inhuman punishments. But even though that's good, we don't have these inhuman punishments. But the authors say that this in another way makes the matter worse. To explain this, they take an analogy of what is called as panopticon. Panopticon was a conceptual design of a prison designed by Jeremy Bentham in 18th century. It was designed for human treatment of prisoners. The idea was there is a round building and along the circumference of that round building are prisoners' cells. At the center of the building, there is a guard and there is one single guard who is supposed to keep an eye on all of the prison cells. Now, obviously, one guard cannot look at all around 360 degrees at the same time. But the key here is the prisoners in those cells cannot see the guard. So they don't know who exactly the guard is watching. So the safest option for them is to assume that the guard is watching them and then they behave. This is called panopticon. 
or panopticon effect. And the authors take an analogy of panopticon effect in our case. What they say is, in the modern liberal society, the penalties or punishments for not abiding by social norms, social norms are not defined. They are not well defined at all. Now, the problem with this is that you have a choice to behave the way you want, but the moral implications of, or, of your behavior are with you. You are responsible for them. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know whether you are right or wrong. You have to trust your own confidence. So, in a way, it's a panopticon effect that you don't know. You don't know who your oppressor is. You don't know what the results are. And that is the panopticon effect within which a lot of anti-natalist or people who are on the fence are caught into. This itself becomes an imposition of sorts. Therefore, the authors argue that for people who are on the fence of antinatalism should break out of that panopticon effect, should break out of that imposition. They also have a suggestion for people like us who are doing antinatalism activism that we should use our arguments diligently and more compassionately. Philosophy of antinatalism is a complex philosophy with hundreds of nuances and we should be debating them, we should be discussing about them to find out what is true, what is right from what is wrong. But given the urgency of the matter, we should have our priorities right. In the words of the authors themselves, put the fire out first. There is plenty of time to discuss the color of the hose later on.